respected uh, chairpersons, uh, dear audience, and today's learned speaker. Good evening to all of you. I, Dr. Deepal Kyodhikari, welcoming you all to today's webinar uh, jointly organized by uh, Department of Cardiology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, and uh, Bangladesh Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And uh, uh, our today's scientific partner is Oxygen in Pharma. I think that all of you will uh, agree with me that ECG is a very basic, simple, and indispensable tool for a cardiologist. But as you know, uh, simple things may not be so simple at times. The same thing goes to ECG also. There are many things uh, behind the screen and maybe uh, that everything is not uh, right as we see with our eyes. Uh, there are many tidbits in ECG. Uh, so it's not so simple uh, all the time. Today we'll I learned some of those from our today's speaker, Professor Robin Chakravarti from Kolkata. Before introducing him, I am honored to introduce the chairpersons of today's session. Uh, they are self-illuminating uh, cardiologists and internists from uh, different parts of our country. Uh, they are Professor Shajal Krishna Banerjee, ex-dean and course director, faculty of medicine and ex-chief Clinical Division and Chairman, Department of Cardiology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Professor Borin Chakravarti, a Senior Consultant, Labored Cardiac Hospital, Dhaka. Professor Chaudhary Mishkat Ahmed, Professor of Cardiology and Chief Division of Heart Failure and Cardiac Rehabilitation and Preventive Cardiology, Department of Cardiology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. And uh, Professor uh, Abdul Kadir Akondo, uh, who is the uh, professor and HOD cardiology, Sarsolimula Medical College and Midford Hospital, and Professor Robert Amin, professor of medicine and uh, line director of non communicable diseases control, uh, DZAs, Bangladesh, Professor uh, Mohammad Mohsen Hussain, professor of electrophysiology and ICVD, Professor uh, uh, Mohammad Khalekud Jaman, professor of cardiology, Dhaka Medical College, and uh, Professor Gonopati Aditya. A uh, renowned cardiologist from Mymenshing, uh, who has recently gone to PRL as a state professor and HOD of Department of Cardiology, Mymenshing Medical, Medical College. Now, as usual, uh, the welcome address from the president of CVRF, Bangladesh chapter. I will request Professor S.M. Mustafa Jaman to give his welcome address. Professor Thank Mustafa you. Jaman, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Dipal Krishna Odekari, and respected chairperson and our foreign faculty, especially Professor Robin Chakraborty, and other respected teachers and my colleagues and, and all fellows. I actually uh, welcome you all in this beautiful evening, and uh, spe especially from Bangladesh Cardiovascular Research Foundation. Welcome you all. And uh, we are trying to make a dedicated, consistent learning space for the cardiologist and medicine specialist last uh, few years. And uh, we are trying to do this type of program uh, every week and uh, not only intervention cardiology, but also on the clinical, uh, also every type of program. And today's topic is very, very interesting. Um, I hope it, uh, our learning curve will increase after the session, especially uh, Dr. Robin Chakraborty is a very, very good, not in the uh, in, uh, intervention mm -hmm. cardiology, but his uh, ECG teaching is very uh, interesting and I hope it will be interactive and our learned chairpersons and faculties and especially our fellows uh, this I, I would I hope this would be a learning uh, interactive program and uh, Dr. Robin Chakraborty uh, told me that uh, there will be four sessions uh, in his lectures and ECGs of ischemic heart disease including acute MI that will be 15 minutes then we'll discuss out with our panelists and chairpersons. Then ECGs of arrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, and tachyarrhythmias, another 15 minutes. Then we'll discuss our, with our panelists and our fellows, faculty and our junior fellows also, our uh, student also. ECG of, ECG of non ischemic and non arrhythmia heart disease, another 15 minutes. Then again, we'll discuss an ECG of ISO critical care, another 15 minutes. That means this would be an interactive program. And uh, uh, Professor Boran Chakraborty also write a good book, everybody knows. And from preface of Professor Boran Chakraborty, 
he, the, the first line, the phenomenal progress and development in the field of cardiology, though I know, I believe, but still now ECG is a big chapter. We don't know everything. And our professors, not only our student, every time, sometimes we discuss what would be or what should be the diagnosis of ECG. So uh, from today's lecture, especially from Dr. Robin Chakraborty and discussion from other our faculties and chairpersons, I hope it would be a beautiful evening with ECG. Thank you. Thank you all. Today's start. Yes, uh, Dr. 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 Deepal Krishna Bikari. Uh, sir, just not not start. Dr. Deepal Krishna Bikari, maybe uh, you are okay. muted. Uh, so actually, uh, I would introduce uh, Dr. Robin Chakraborty. Uh, Mr. Kuto, please uh, show the slide. Then I would say something Mr. about Dr. Dr. Please Robin show the budget of our honorable speaker. Maybe Dr. Deepal is muted. Oh, sorry, sorry, I am I am, I am muted. Uh, so I will I will request Professor Jaman to introduce our uh, speaker, Professor Robin Chakravarti, in a, a very few uh, words. Thank you. Already I mentioned his name and uh, Dr. Uh, Robin Chakravarti, senior consultant intervention cardiologist and electrophysiologist of not only in India but uh, everywhere in this part, every world. He is a very good. Renowned intervention countries, along with is a good electrophysiologist also. Uh, especially, he is now working in and a senior vice chairman of cardiology services of Medica Group of Hospitals and examiner of MRCP UK, examiner of National Board DNB Cardiology, chairperson of Health Myrita Committee, Sir. the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, president elect Indian College of Cardiology, associate editor journal of Indian Medical Association. Jima, and uh, he had published more than 100 uh, publications in uh, national and international uh, scientific journal. And he's the faculty of TCT USA, Europe, ECR, TCT, Asia Pacific, faculty of complex cardiovascular catheter conference, C3, since 2017 7 to 2019, Orlando, Florida, USA. And uh, uh, he's very good teacher and our good well wisher of Bangladesh. And uh, Please, Professor Dr. Robin Chakraborty, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. That was a really wonderful introduction. So, without wasting much time, we'll start uh, with the, uh, the presentation. I suggest that although there are 15 15 minutes, there may be minor difference here and there. So, eventually, it will be over by one hour time. I request uh, all the panelists, as well as the faculty, as well as the uh, listeners, the people, the fellows, please ask your question through chat box. And I'm sure that our uh, renowned panelists, uh, chairpersons, and faculty, including myself, will be able to answer as much as possible. So, as you may understand, that this is a uh, this is a huge chapter. We may not cover in in such a short time. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort of show you some interesting ECGs which will be extremely helpful for you to understand the clinical situation and also to take some important decision uh, in terms of management from, from that point of view. So, uh, uh, so important is at the end of the day, we should treat patients and we should recognize the patient, understand the clinical condition of the patient and therefore DCG as our uh, uh, chairperson, Dr. Adhikari said very clearly, this is a very common tool but important tool for the cardiologist. And uh, without ECG, you cannot really call yourself as a cardiologist. With that, we will start with the uh, talk. So first, we'll start about with ischemic heart disease. Let us start with the story. A 64-year-old gentleman, exertional chest pain at low level of exercise, and this is the ECG. What do you think uh, the abnormalities? So this is the ECG. Can you see that? So clearly, this is in sinus rhythm. This is a PQRS, PQRS, and the axis is more or less normal. And if you look at the precordial lead, there is a normal progression of uh, sort of QRS complex from G1 to G6. There is not much of difference. And, uh, and in addition to that, there is also uh, something that uh, whether or not there is some ST elevation there in uh, uh, AVR. 
but this ST elevation may be there, but this ST elevation can also be there in uh, in, in V one, but it is not there. This is, there is not much of ST elevation there. So people may think that this is a kind of left main or left main equivalent, but one has to be aware that to call something as left main equivalent, you do not. Uh, if you have a left main equivalent, you should also have significant ST segment depression in the anterior precordial lead there, V two, V three, and others, which you do not have. What you have here, you have got significant ST depression of the inferior lead, particularly lead two, lead three, AVF, and also to, to some extent at V5 and V6. So that goes really against a kind of left-sided problem like a left main or even proximal LAD. There is no no uh, sort of change in this ST segment you know, which represent the LAD or even proximal left main. Uh, on the other hand. The uh, ST segment depression is localized at lead two, lead three, and AVF, and to some extent to V5, V6. So this is an exception one has to be aware of. And there are certain changes in AVL. So if you have such kind of abnormality, one has to remember that that your ST elevation in AVL without much ST elevation in V1 and other, and other things may not always be sort of left main. There could also be a very dominant right coronary artery. With a very proximal occlusion of right coronary artery and very critical obstruction, we have seen many such occasions. I have two such kind of angiogram which can show you this. I will, this particular ECG uh, actually, this is the angiogram which shows a very critical obstruction, very critical obstruction at right coronary artery, and it is a super dominant right coronary artery. If you have a super dominant right coronary artery, and if the lesion is in the first part of the right coronary artery from there till anywhere there. Including the ostium, very critical obstruction, and the left segment is relatively small. Then you can actually get a similar picture, which may mimic a left mainstem disease. So this is an example where even a little bit of area elevation with significant ST segment depression in inferior lead and lateral lead can actually be uh, can be due to the very critical obstruction of proximal, very very proximal right coronary artery. I got another actually patient where the obstruction was at the right ostium, and the left system was small and the huge uh, uh, predominant, super dominant right system uh, showed an ECG, which actually showed similar changes. In this situation, it is important also to remember. It is also important to remember that there could be uh, what is called uh, uh, the super dominant right coronary system can also be associated with. Uh, Changes in the right-sided precordial lead. So, if you suspect that there could be superdominant right coronary artery, a left system is relatively small. From the ECG, it is always a good habit to do a right-sided precordial ECG, which clearly will show you, particularly at V4R, will clearly show you significant ST segment changes. This is one. Look at look at the next case. A 52-year-old gentleman. There is no history of ischemic heart disease. Patient is known to have hypertension on treatment. Patient presents with acute onset of chest pain. And during chest pain, listen to me very carefully. During chest pain, there was a ECG was normal and cardiac enzymes were normal as well. Patient was kept in the emergency because of significant chest pain and patient was admitted for observation. After some time, the chest pain subsided. Patient was hemodynamically stable. At that time, the ECG was taken, and this is the ECG. This ECG shows that significant ST segment changes involving only the precordial lead like V2, V3, V4, and V5, and V5, and shows ST segment goes up and down, up and down like that. This is a classical demonstration. Like if you have a such ECG with this symptom, and the patient probably has got acute coronary syndrome, and this is almost always. Due to very critical lesions of proximal LAD, and is well known as Wellen syndrome. Remember, in Wellen syndrome, the the ECG changes does not appear during chest pain. ECG changes in Wellen syndrome appear after the chest pain once the patient is chest pain free and stable. So you may think that patient is stable, so patient can be sent home. And asking to come back to the hospital if there is further pain. This type of pain, if you discharge, 
without recognizing these abnormalities in the ECG, you will not be surprised to see that this patient may come back as a broad dead patient, as a broad dead, because they get a very proximal disease of LAD. And as another example of similar thing like this ECG, you can see again, the same change in ST goes up and down, is up and down, such changes are there. Occasionally you can get ventricular, you can get a ventricular ectopic. This is again an example of Wellens syndrome. Remember, the ECG changes are not during chest pain, it is during rest of the patient. So in this ECG, as I said, this is the changes, the ROA progression normal, ST segment is biphasic, particularly from V2 to V5. There may be slight ST elevation in V1, but AVR is normal. AVR is normal. The pathological change, why you get such change? The pathophysiology mechanism of such EC change is unclear. It could be due to significant obstruction and destabilizing the blood flow as had been hypothesized by Professor Wallens and causing local, local edema and stunning of the myocardium. And again, there's a flow comes back. So because of the intermittent obstruction, there is local edema and there is destabilization of the blood flow along the left anterior descending artery territory, causing some abnormal ECG changes. Professor Wellen is a great sort of personality. And uh, so I knew him personally. He used to call me by my name and I used to call him by sir. And he came to Kolkata. Some of you might have attended when he was with us in one of the conference. And then after that, many a times we met in different parts of the world. So this is the ECG changes. You can see clearly very critical obstruction of the proximal LAD, and that is uh, the situation. In such a case, you should immediately take the patient to cat fat and try to fix this blockage by angioplasty. And this is a life-saving uh, procedure, but it has to be recognized in the emergency when the patient comes to you with chest pain and keep the patient under observation for a while, let the patient subside, and they then uh, sort of do the ECG. So what is important, if the patient comes to the emergency with chest pain and then under observation, patient is stabilized, there is no chest pain, do not send the patient home without repeating the ECG. Repeat the ECG even if there is no pain. And then you see the ECG and then make a decision that whether or not patient should be taken to cat lab or patient may be taken to the ward or patient may go back home. There's another case of 76-year-old lady who is otherwise healthy, heart that her 40 years old son had an accident, a sudden onset of severe shortness of breath with chest pain, nausea, and diaphoresis. He, she lives alone on domestic health. This is the ECG. You can see the ST segment elevation, V1, V2, V3. So ECG in emergency. And then the cardiac catheterization did not show any obstructive coronary artery disease, but eventually patient progressively collapsed, went into cardiogenic shock. Required intraortic balloon pump, started on noradrenaline and adrenaline. And then the ECG remains elevated, persistent elevation is going up after 24 hours later. This is an example of moderate to severe, echocardiogram shows moderate to severe systolic dysfunction, but there is no wall motion abnormality. Only the proximal segment of septum and anterolateral wall shows contracting normally, but the inferior wall, other part, there is no regional distribution of, of the wall motion abnormal. There was ballooning of the distal ventricle, ejection fraction of 20%. These findings are consistent with what is known as Takasubo syndrome. They can, they can be associated with functional mitral regurgitation. And this is an angiogram we showed a bit of that, bit of an aneurysmal dilatation. But remember, eventually it all subsides. People has been described as acute stress, cardiomyopathy, reversible hepatic systolic dysfunction in the absence of coronary artery disease. It was first described in Japan. There is maybe global distribution, also known as broken heart syndrome. We do not know the exact pathogenesis. There are a lot of uh, sort of postulation. It can be triggered by emotion, physical and mental stress, and commonly present with shortness of breath or even chest pain. There may be shock and ECG changes or acute ischemic syndrome. Mechanism could be catecholamine induced vessel ventricular dysfunction due to stress hormone release. There could be multivessel coronary spasm. There could be dynamic left ventricle output and obstruction leading to aneurysmal dilatation of, uh, of LVFA. These are all transient and eventually it subsides. That is very important for us to recognize. How will you distinguish from acute coronary syndrome? Abnormal ST elevation or depression, 
cardiac biomarkers with the elevated wall motion abnormality, large area of single artery involvement does not show. It is a different type of wall motion abnormality. If we do MRI, which is very characteristic of lack of delayed hyper enhancement of MRI, do not say, do not see hyper enhancement of MRI of uh, in, in uh, <coughs> enhancement in cardiac MRI. So that is an ECG. There are many other things we can discuss, but we can uh, take some discussion from the panelists. Okay, first 15 minutes over. Thank you, Dr. Ravan Chakraborty. Uh, I'd request our panelists, uh, please, uh, if any comment, uh, you may put your comment. Or, or... Dr. Ravan Chakraborty. Yes, my name is Baran Chakraborty. Yes, I request Dr. Ravan Chakraborty to your show the first ECG. Go first ECG. First ECG. Yes. The first so ECG. That? Yeah, that one. That one was a RC occlusion. RC yes. occlusion. First one. Yes. Yeah, this ECG. And in this ECG, in fact, there is far difference between the clinical teaching and the cath lab findings. There's many a times. If this is ECG is given, if you if we see about this ECG, if we look at it, you see that ST depression, not in the only in the inferior list, he has got ST depression in lead one, lead two, lead three, AVA, V4, V5, V6. Classically, the standard teaching is that the left main occlusion, if this ECG is given in the exam, if this ECG is given to me in exam, I will not say that this is the right the RC occlusion. I will immediately say that possibly it is the left main occlusion because the left main occlusion ECG presentation may be two types. Either the patient may present with HT elevation or the patient come with a very uh, diffuse HT depression. One thing is that if the HT depression is more marked more than seven to eight leads, along with HT elevation in AVR, this is a classical clinical teaching that the patient is probably has a left main occlusion. So this is one of the thing, if, it, if this ECG is given to an exam to a student, so immediately I will think that this is, this is, is a left main disease. But when the uh, Professor Robin Chokrudi did the angiogram, it came, is a, it came out as a uh, RC, as a very super dominant RC occlusion. But this RC occlusion, the ECG finding does not inagreeable with the cath lab findings. There's a difference. Many a times we see that, many a times I saw the patient has got HT elevation and lead one and AVL. I think it is a D1 occlusion, but when I do the angiogram, I see it is a LED occlusion. So sometimes it happens like that. But this ECG, in fact, in clinical teaching, I, I, I think there are so many students are there. If this ECG is given on in exam, I think the, the, the uh, uh, student should say that possibly this is a left main occlusion. Agree. Uh, I think it's very, very well said, Dr. excellent, excellent comment. I really appreciate that. And uh, it, in fact, that was, it was a surprise to me also. But what is important, as you said very rightly, if you find there is extensive depression, at least more than se seven out of 12 leads, more than seven out of 12 leads, then the suggestion of left main is very strong. So what is important is people always talk about left main, left main, left main, but one has to remember that even the super dominant right coronary artery, if it's a very proximal, even osteal occlusion actually behaves like a left main, you need to remember that a super dominant right coronary artery means the left coronary artery is, is very small. It is very small, small, small size artery. So the right coronary artery actually supplies the entire my, my, my sort of left area, yeah, left entire ventricular territory. So it is, it is basically the same mechanism, which is, is it is basically proximal, and a huge area of myocardium is at risk. What is essentially important in this particular ECG. And that is also important for our fellows and students to, to notice that had it been a purely left main critical stenosis, then the V2, V3, and V4 would not have been exempted. Here, V2, V3 is completely normal. That is the point one has to remember. In a critical left main, if you just see from the next case onward, such an ST elevation in ABR without any change in V2, V3, and V4, one has to consider that whether or not it is. It could be very super dominant right coronary artery. But as you said, in an exam, in a fellows exam or even an MD cardiology exam, if someone writes it's a left main, I will probably pass. But it is a differential diagram. It is as I said that people got really carried away with left main and AVR elevation. But there are so many exceptions. 
so that ST segment elevation in AVR, one of such exception is his case. I think so many students are also watching this one. In fact, the late main occlusion can present in ECG either with a diffuse ST depression or ST elevation mimicking an extensive anterior myocardial infarction. But for the students, I want to add one thing. If a left main occlusion comes with a ST elevation MI, that means extensive anterior MI, the differentiation point is AVR ST elevation and V1 ST elevation. Yes. If AVR ST elevation is more than V1, it goes in favor of left main occlusion. If V1 ST elevation is more than AVR ST elevation, it goes in favor of very proximal LED occlusion. Very, very, very proximal. But it is, yeah, yeah, it is a, it's a usual teaching. It is a book teaching only. But one of the students should know that the, the uh, left main occlusion can, can come with present with diffuse ST depression more than seven to eight leads out of these 12 leads or can present as like as ST elevation, um, anterior myocardial infarction with ST elevation in AVR. Correct. Excellent. Uh, in, uh, in, Dr. Rabin Chakraborty, uh, yeah. two questions actually uh, already. Can I? Can box. I yes, I, Professor uh, Abdul Kader Akhan. Professor Abdul Kader Akhan, Professor and Head yeah. Department of Cardiology, Sarsoli Munda Medical College. Professor, uh, Professor Rubin Chakraborty, basically he is an interventional cardiologist, but today he showed that Interventional cardiology should know the basic as well. And by his presentation in 3 ECG, he taught a big thing. I think it is, a, it is very important, especially not for only the learner, also the learned person as well, because these are the ECG where we are confused in many times. In first ECG, already Professor Boren Chakraborty discussed in detail Usually with this kind of issues, we think either there is involvement of the left main coronary artery or there is multifacial involvement. That is the usual interpretation. But the Robin Chakraborty very clearly showed that it is not the dictum. It is not 100% true in every ECG. So if ECG says about the involvement of the coronary artery, that is the common consensus, but there is deviation in many cases that has been shown by the Robin Chakraborty very nicely. And I'm really impressed with the ECG and the uh, angiography finding that he uh, described. But one thing struck in my mind that the right coronary which appeared <laughs> as it is is really perplexed with the diameter of the right coronary artery. It is the super right coronary artery. But for the learners, many learners may confuse that it may be the ectatic coronary artery. So here we have to also differentiate the ectatic right coronary artery and the super right coronary artery. And second ECG is very important. Very important because this kind of ECG always we are experiencing the patient coming with chest pain and this kind of STT changes and there is no enzymatic elevation and other but the patient remain unstable and many cases we are um, going for angiographic evaluation we are getting the picture that Robin Chakraborty very clearly shown so in this ECG presentation by an renowned interventional cardiologist teaches us that clinical assessment, ECG assessment, and all steps before going to the invasive and interventional procedure is very important for becoming a genuine interventional cardiologist. Thank you, Professor Robin Chakraborty. Uh, thank Professor, you, Professor, Professor, Professor Andu, sir. Uh, uh, Professor, I, I, I would mention two questions, uh, Professor uh, I am also uh, mentioning the question also but, okay. uh, from Dr. Shamsundar. Can you please uh, yes. read yes. the questions? Yes. Can yes. you read? Yeah. Yes, I am reading. Actually, two questions. Krishna oh. Chandra Odhikari, uh, he has questions uh, maybe. Uh, from Nepal, maybe I don't know, maybe ne from Nepal. Yeah, yeah, he's from Nepal. <clears throat> Average duration of Takosubo syndrome on case, maybe showed by Professor Ravan Chakraborty. Actually, uh, the duration of uh, the return to the normal and the changes of ECG, uh, uh, any experience, uh, any, any anybody can say. Another uh, question from Nepal also, maybe Sham Shundar. 
uh, he actually tell us uh, want to know about the significance of AVR. Already, uh, uh, Professor Boran Chakraborty and uh, already discussed, <coughs> discussed, and uh, Professor Raman Chakraborty already discussed some uh, uh, rules and regulations and some importance of AVR. So, uh, any comment from but these two questions? The, I have got one comment. Somebody was asking regarding the tachycardia, but cardiomyopathy regarding the ECG finding. AVR is very important. Usually, differentiation <coughs> between anterior myocardial infarction and uh, in our last uh, journal, we published uh, two cases of tachycardia cardiomyopathy from Levet Cardiac Hospital. And one important thing is that AVR is a very important lead for diagnosis of uh, tachycardia cardiomyopathy. HT elevation AVR because in anterior leads, in the both anterior MI and um, uh, the tachycardia uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, the HT is elevated usually in the anterior leads. But one thing is that you look at the AVR. If in AVR there is ST elevation, it is possibly not tachycardia cardiomyopathy because tachycardia cardiomyopathy usually do not give rise to ST elevation in AVR. This is a very standard teaching. But if AVR is depressed in, in AVR, along with the ST elevation in anterior list goes in favor of tachycardia cardiomyopathy. But only thing that in the most of the cases, the tachycardia cardiomyopathy is a benign and it goes back to already. But there is a certain percentage of patients, they may not come back to their normalization. Ultimately, they remain disabled with the LV dysfunction. That one is the uh, usual thing is that, that all the patients do not, uh, their LV function do not normalize. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, the next step uh, you may proceed because uh, a lot of discussion. One thing, maybe... Dr. Robin Chakravarti, uh, can I see Sorry. the second is second the Wilen Wilen syndrome? Wilen syndrome. Yeah, any comment on that? You want to make any in comment? fact, this Wilen, this Wilen syndrome is a, in the it is definitely the two thing. It is a HT elevation myocardial infarction equivalent this one, and this requires the primary angioplasty also, like B winter T. Only thing that the ECG, uh, Dr. Robin Chakravarti showed, this is a Willian type A. The type A, Willian has got two types of syndrome. One is type A syndrome and type B syndrome. This one, preserving the R wave in the V1 to V3, along with the biphasic Q wave, is a type A Willian syndrome. This is also indicative of the proximal LED occlusion. And it is only present 25% cases of the Willian syndrome. But 75% of the Wilhelm syndrome, which also indicates very proximal LED occlusion, this is not the biphasic T. And this one gives rise to very deep TOAV inversion V1 to V4. This is called Wilhelm syndrome type B. And type A and type B, though the ECG features is different, but the cath lab features is same. And they are indicative of very proximal LED occlusion. So Wilhelm has described equivalent to ST elevation myocardial infarction, type A and type B. Type A present with biphasic TOAV in V1 to V4, along with preservation of ROA, and the type B present with the very deep TOAVs from V1 to V4. Am I correct, Ravinda? Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Very nice. In fact, I think, as you said very nicely, I think I just elaborate on this point a little bit, a little bit just in 10 seconds. What happens here, it all depends upon at what point you are catching the patient. For example, patient had chest pain. And patient is recovering from chest pain, it's getting stable, pain-free. You do an ECG, you will get a classical thing. Maybe later on, you wait for a little longer period of time, it will change. If you wait for a further longer period of time, it may change further. So it's a, it could be a spectrum of the same pathology going with time. There's another group of patients when well in, Professor Wellen described that one is that a discrete LED proximal disease may show one change. If you have a longer segment of ST segment, uh, a LED disease, which may actually involve diagonal, septal, and other branches, then you may change a little different thing, which may not be the classical wellen. So that is a different thing. But when Professor Wellen described, he actually described this. What is important for my for our students and fellows to, to recognize that chest pain, the ECG changes are, are found only when the patient is pain-free. That is important. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ravin Chakra. Please go ahead. Uh, so now we'll talk about a little bit of arrhythmia. Yes. Let us talk this. So this is the one. So now uh, the first few ECGs may have associated ischemia plus uh, bradycardia. So this ECG, you can see clearly that these are all in QRS complex is narrow. 
This is P and R. P R interval appears to be prolonged. But what is interesting is that if you look at the prolongation of the P R interval from from bit to bit, this P R is shorter than this P R, or maybe this P R is longer than this P R, and third P R is even farther longer than first two P R, and after that there is a complete drop. Wankeback. So it is a wankeback, right? So progressive prolongation of the P R interval, and at the same time there is significant S T elevation of lead in lead two, lead three, and and A V F. With some chest segment of depression at one and AVL and V2 and V3 and, and and other lateral leads, so it indicates that there is a significant inferior myocardial infarction with two three AVL. So I am sure there should not be any any disagreement on this. This kind kind of ECG should be picked up even by the the first year or second year by MD cardiology students. What is important for us to recognize that if you have significant ST elevation. Along with ST cell depression, so many leads. What is important for for cardiologists to 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 understand and also to recognize that the 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 mean deviation of ST segment both upward and downward. If you look at the ST elevation, again there is ST segment deviation upward. If you look at the ST segment segment depression, again deviation downward. If you calculate the total deviation, if the deviation is more than 35, that means that is a significant area. Of myocardium is at risk uh, of uh, of the uh, deprivation of blood supply. So this kind of patient needs urgent attention. If you have two such patient in in, a, in your emergency, if a patient with significant asymptomatic deviation both upward and downward, that patient, along with kind of a AV node uh, disease, this indicates that AV node artery is affected. Conduction disturbance. If you ever find in an inferior wall myocardial infarction, I'm repeating it again. If you find conduction system problem like AV, AV block, second degree block, third degree block, whatever, you never ever think that this could be circumflex. Never ever, because there is a there is an algorithm by which ST elevation in two versus three for circumflex or RCA. That formula is not applicable in a situation when you have got conduction system problem like AV node uh, blockage. That means AV nodal artery is supplied by right coronary artery, even if it is non-dominant. So that is the point one has to remember. So this is the right coronary artery. Move to the next one. The another one you can see that this patient again has got a QRS, which is white. Now the QRS is white, very it's a kind of right bundle band block with PR interval, which is variable. If you look at P, this PR is shorter. This pair is longer. This pair is much more longer. So there is no uh, kind of association between P and QRS, which means that P and QRS are dissociated. Along with that, there is a bradycardia. There is right bundle band block and left axis deviation. So the complete diagnosis is complete right bundle band block, left axis deviation, and there are some changes of ST segment and QRS inversion in in the precordial lead. So that probably indicates that patient has got. And as anterior wall myocardial infarction, many people may think that in anterior wall myocardial infarction or LAD involvement, there may not be any complete heart block, right? So what happens here that this patient is not only has got a LAD infarction. You have to remember that this patient, this patient may have multi-vessel coronary artery disease, out of which LAD got acutely occluded. So, because of the multi-vessel coronary artery disease, the right coronary artery was already compromised from its circulation. Therefore, the LAD blockage has created right bundle branch block, and or it is also possible that right bundle branch block may be pre-existing. From one ECG, it is very difficult to say. Very difficult. Either it is pre-existing or it has happened. But there is significantly complete heart block means that there is a Some kind of right coronary artery involvement. Very unlikely that right coronary got infarcted. Probably there is a right coronary already compromised because of pre-existing disease. So that is a kind of reading from the ECG. But ECG diagnosis: complete AV block with peak QRS dissociation, complete right bundle branch block, left anterior bundle block, along with anterior myocardial infarct. If we move further, this is another ECG which you can see this patient has got a complete left bundle branch block. Along with that, there is P, P, and third P is conducted, but two P's are not conducted. So two is to one sort of conduction. 
and patient had chest pain with syncope. So, what is important is to recognize that in this ECG, there is a complete LBBB. There is a, some kind of ROA progression, but ST segment doesn't appear to have an associated uh, MI. It's very difficult to predict. It may, it may suggest that there could be some ST elevation, but doesn't look like a COVID. But what is important that, that in left bundle branch block, we find HD segment or ethioid is usually discordant. Here it is concordant. So if you find there is a concordant ethioid in presence of left bundle branch block, that is abnormal. That indicates that there is an associated cardiac structural disease. It could be cardiomyopathy, it could be ischemic heart disease, chronic ischemic heart disease. It could be there are so many causes. This patient seems has a history of chest pain. There is a left bundle branch block and there is a syncope. I think you should First, you should stabilize the patient with a pacemaker and maybe a temporary pacemaker. And then after stabilizing the patient, you should definitely do an angiogram to exclude whether, whether or not there is an associated coronary artery disease. In view of the fact of history of chest pain, of chest pain as well as that there is a uh, disconcordant in the in those leads where there is a white QRS complex suggesting complete left bundle and block. Uh, this patient has a very interesting 27 year a man complaining of mild disease pale with palpitation doesn't need a pacemaker. <laughs> if you look at that there is a long pause. So this is a 24 hour ECG. If you see a 24 hour ECG patient comes to be a young man comes to be with, with kind of mother says or when, the, or when his wife says that there is a history of disease pale not real no history of syncopal attack and you ask for a 24 hour ECG. ECG shows that a long pause. So you may think that patient may need a pacemaker. What is important for everyone to, to understand that at what time the pause was observed. If the pause was observed, let us sort of an, an early a morning, then it may be very unlikely that this could be uh, this could be a what is called a kind of significant pause. Although in this situation it is about ten thirty six and then another one at at six uh, uh, six o'clock. So, but this observation is important. The other important is that to remember that a young boy coming with disease spell and palpitation, it could also be because of vagal. So, what is important? If you look at this, this ECG, it is important to see this pause and also this, also you should see the other QRS complex, other uh, sort of between the QRS complex, what is the pause like? Like there is a long pause like here, but if you see this ECG very carefully, there's a long pause, there's a long pause, but if you see them, this, pause, this, this gap is shorter than this gap, this gap is again longer than this gap. If you look at this one, long pause, but this gap is shorter than this gap. So there's a little pause, then there's a little pause, long pause, and again there's a pause, it comes back. Besides, variation of pause in a 24 ECG does not happen in AV node disease or even six sinus syndrome. If you find that the pause is fluctuating a different thing, that means there is some other influence which is changing the pause. Most common is vagal nerve. So like this is, a, there's, a, there's a longer gap, there's a longer gap, there's a gap, but this is normal. So had, had it been a AV node disease, it's normal, 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 boom, long pause. So that is one thing one has to remember. This is an example. So obviously this patient has got a high vagal tone creating two is to one drop. So this probably, the sinus was slowed down before the block. That is an indication that this is a vagus thing. So sinus flowing before a kind of a long block or twist one block indicates that it is a vagal. This is another example where you can see there is a long pause, 18, 18 millisecond. But before that, you can see there's another pause, another pause. This is another example, like normal, normal, there's, there's a pause, then there's a pause, again normal. Normal, again pause, again pause. So much fluctuation of the pause in a 24 ECG always is due to autonomic influence rather than a structural conduction tissue disease. I think I should skip that. Coming back to the next one, this is an atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. There is a narrow QRS complex. You do not identify the PUA, but if we look at the V1 and V2, or even 2, 3, AB, you can see a retrograde P wave. That is retrograde P wave. If you find this retrograde P wave is, is just on the top of the QRS complex, most likely this is atrioventricular 
nodal reinfant tachycardia we call them pseudo r this is called pseudo r is a classical case of av nrt uh, uh, this is called uh, classical type 1 and uh, or or which is called a type 1 av nrt or uh, typical av nrt often called typical av nrt the treatment is uh, radio frequency therapy so we do very often every month we do plenty of such cases another case which is where it's very fast rate and the qrs complex is little different is right bundle thing sort of thing and a very complex sort of thing this could be av nrt just from the tachycardia ecg difficult to say you need to have a sinus ecg as well at the same time the twebly ecg after the cardioversion of the tachycardia these are very helpful and this kind of case can be associated with wpw syndrome remember wpw syndrome means short pr interval delta wave or even there could be pseudo white qrs complex because of delta wave but unless there is a tachycardia we do not call it wpw syndrome wpw syndrome means short pr interval delta wave there is a pseudo widening of qrs complex and tachycardia that is called wpw syndrome otherwise it is called pre excitation syndrome another case you can see there is a sinus uh, uh, rhythm after that there is a tachycardia and then the tachycardia goes up sinus rhythm comes back once this look at the tachycardia what is it is it atrial cardia atrial tachycardia av nrt or av or or avrt what is important for us to understand that in the in the tachycardia you should see the beginning of tachycardia and the end of tachycardia you see the tachycardia ends with qrs complex tachycardia does not end with p wave when the tachycardia begins there is a pqrs complex but after that the p wave morphology this p wave is not same like this it is a different p wave so if the p wave morphology changes and then it continues sometimes sometimes we call it warm up phenomena and then if it goes off it goes up at qrs not at p most likely it is atrial tachycardia and if you really sort of do it proper measurement you find that atrial tachycardia the p qrs interval at times can be variable because we know that in ventricular tachycardia there is pqrs dissociation similarly in atrial tachycardia there can also be pqrs dissociation having said this we also remember that pqrs association can also be there both in atrial tachycardia as well as in ventricular tachycardia he is a young man 32 year young man structurally normal heart with palpitation with a white here this is a kind of a right bundle morphology but there is a left axis deviation structurally normal heart and if you look at the the b5 b3 b4 b5 it is relatively narrow and that is classical example of example of fascicular ventricular tachycardia in fact today i saw one patient of exactly same 32 year gentleman this ecg is not this black patient ecg it is a different ecg but this is an example of of the of fascicular vt treatment is this is also a what known as verapamil sensitive ventricular tachycardia normally verapamil is contraindicated in ventricular tachycardia but this is an exception where verapamil can be prescribed in ventricular tachycardia known as verapamil sensitive ventricular tachycardia idiopathic ventricular tachycardia or, or sometimes ilvt idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia or fascicular ventricular tachycardia fascicular ventricular tachycardia has a different classification which we will not go into detail but this is the mechanism that what happens here that there is a fascicle there is integrally it goes through the uh, this the, the anterior fascicle this the it is the p2 like it goes like this it impulse actually traveling like this then it finds it is blocked as it blocks then it it finds an another pathway then it goes through this and comes back actually it goes it is this is the anterior fascicle goes like p1 it goes through this and then it should come back it it just it finds a block so it goes it turns around and then goes back and and creates the reentrant circuit is a reentrant tachycardia a 20 year old boy with simple attack diagnosis so it it, it could be fast vt atrial fatter or ek with repeatable double bit long qt it is not it is vt very straight forward because if you look at the qrs morphology it's exactly the same it is not Uh, it, atrial fibrillation because RR interval is not variable, and it is not atrial fibrillation. It is classical ventricular tachycardia. Most likely, it is RBOT VT. That is why, since it is RBOT, QRS is white, 
is upward in 2, 3 ABF means inferior axis and it is left bundle morphology. That is what is the diagnosis. And this is the last one. I think probably you can skip. This is a very tough one. Probably I can skip. Probably I can skip that. I think I got 15 minutes over. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Robin. Uh, sir, I am to announce some uh, senior physicians who are in the backstage. So I am requesting to our organizer to make them as panelists. Uh, they are uh, Professor Kobiru Jaman from Heart Foundation, Professor Mokad, uh, Dr. Mokadda Sosen Sadi, who is a uh, electrophysiologist also, okay, Professor, sir, Amal Kumar, Professor Amal Kumar Choudhury from NICBD, Professor uh, Dr. Fatima Begum from United Hospital, Professor Saidur Rahman Khan from uh, Ibrahim Kadek Hospital and Research uh, Institute, uh, and Professor Roshan Ali, uh, from Uttara Women's Medical College. Uh, sir, Robin, sir, please continue. Right. So, uh, I think I'll just show some two ECGs which will be important. 24-year boy with repeated episodes of transient unconsciousness. You can see QRS is narrow, but clearly it is a prolonged QT interval. Now, how to, show, uh, how to diagnose prolonged QT interval? Make it simple. If you find in your everyday practice, if you find this QT from beginning of Q to end of T is more than 50% of the RR interval, that is long Q. Very simple. If from beginning of Q to the end of T, if it is more than 50% of RR, that is long Q. So it is a long Q, long Q syndrome. This is a diagnosis. So what happens here? Why patient is unconscious? Because probably patient is getting polymorphy ventricular tachycardia known as torsadi de pointis. That is the why it happened. So, the three point is there are multiple mechanisms. It could be prolonged repolarization, which may cause early depolarization. There could be mid ventricular myocardial cells, uh, which may show more sort of uh, more sort of a delayed, more and more delayed or more prolonged action potential prolongation in response to eye care blockage. So, that could be one of the mechanisms. This causes dispersion of repolarization. Remember, that from Q to QRS is depolarization, and after that depolarization starts till end of beginning of P wave. P wave is the depolarization of atria. So because of the longer uh, repolarization time, and then there, there is a action potential prolongation because the mid ventricular cells are not active at that point of time. This causes dispersion of repolarization, or called heterogeneous uh, kind, of, kind of excitability. And that the complex re-entry eventually may provoke torsa de point. This is the postulation of torsa de point is in long QT syndrome. There is, but there is, remember one point for everybody, especially the exam in going candidate. There is no linear correlation between drug dose and QT prolongation. There is no relationship between degree of QT prolongation and likelihood of development of torsa de point. So it is better to like, be aware of QT interval prolongation and also to understand the importance of it. What is important in long QT syndrome is to, to, to know, to get the history of, family history of unconsciousness of QT prolongation. Or if, there's a, if it is in the history of family, then chances of having complication is very high. Or if you find this exercise induced some syncopal attack or sudden cardiac death, like football player, the other day in Euro Cup, there is some, some, somebody had a thing. We do not know the cause. It could be even coronary artery disease. That is one of the commonest cause, though. It could be cardiomyopathy. But long term, it should also be remembered in exercise induced sudden cardiac death or syncopal attack. I stop it here. A quick comment, then we move further. Already one hour is over. Uh, any comment from our panelists, uh, chairpersons, or any questions from audience? Dr. Robin Chakrabhati, can I see the first ECG inferior MI with one back phenomena? You follow, why you always go for the first ECG? <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs> go ahead. Yeah, this ECG, I want to add that one. Definitely, this is an inferior MI. And Dr. Rabin Chakrabhita also told that if with in inferior MI, there's a conduction defect, there's an RCA blockage, definitely. But is there any suggestion that the patient has got concurrent posterior infarct and uh, RV infarction? Of course, yes, 100%. Definitely, because... Oh, yes. 
because from from 12 plate ecg it's very difficult to understand whether the patient has got rv in fact but we usually do the uh, uh, v3r v4 r but one thing is that if the patient of inferior mi if in the v1 if the st leave if there is no st depression if the st is isoelectric it indicates that possibly there is concurrent this is the only way how we can predict rv infarction from 12 standard 12 plate ecg look at the st segment in the v1 if the v1 is not depressed only isoelectric it also indicates rv infarction another one okay. thing that look at the r amplitude in the v2 and st depression profound st depression in v2 but there is no st depression v1 there is a the tall r in v1 and v2 is that v2 is indicates that concurrent posterior infarction but if we want to confirm that the patient has got posterior infarct we will have to do the v7 v8 v9 so that one is very indicative but from the standard um, uh, uh, 12 plate ecg rv infarct can be gauged by the isoelectric st in v1 and posterior infarct can be gauged tall r in v2 with profound st depression in v2 so this patient has got inferior mi one ke back phenomena rv infarction at the same time has got the post infarction also absolutely right on the dot great yeah. and simply happy. yeah don't the can can see the fascicular vt say it again fascicular vt you showed the fascicular vt that is cg yeah this one so this one for the only because we know that that we have got uh, two fascicle left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle this is an excellent ecg shown by professor robin chakraborty the vt with rbb morphology so vt with rbb morphology the, how the fascicular vt differentiates from the classic vt qrs uh, duration is important because fascicular vt the qrs is not very prolonged usually in the range of 120 to 140 is it Ravinda, I am mean, correct. Yes, absolutely. But if it is VT, ischemic VT, or other VT, the QRS complex is very, very wide. It is more than one forty millisecond. If the VT is in LBB morphology, the QRS is usually more than one sixty. If it is with the RBB morphology, it is around one forty. But in fascicular VT, the QRS is not that much prolonged. But fascicular VT in uh, in exam. the examiner can ask whether the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle because left fascicle has got two one is left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle the classical teaching is that if the rbb vt is associated with left axis deviation it arises from the left posterior fascicle posterior absolutely posterior if the rbb morphology comes with the r rbb right axis deviation okay. it comes from the anterior fascicle yes. so this one is a is a standard practice we do that one perfect absolutely ट Slow fast, yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. and how it differentiates? Because is it a AVNRT or AVRT? This differentiation is a, it is not for the electrophysiologist. As a clinician, we also should know that in this state of narrow complex and um, uh, QRS complex, uh, we are tachycardia. The pseudo R and um, uh, Dr. Robin Chakrab also that in a uh, 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 narrow complex tachycardia, if you cannot discern the uh, uh, do it correctly possibly it is a classic svt that means slow fast e but if that svt is due to fast slow then sometimes pof can be seen am i correct yes yes that is a different yes. thing that that's that a different diagnosis that yes, is definitely different. but only okay. difference that yeah. we must know that the avnrt and avrt this is not it is this is not avrt big sorry reciprocating tachycardia because the patient has got a pseudo one in v1 sometimes Not only the pseudo R, the POF can appear as pseudo S. I see in one elite two there is one pseudo R. There is suggestion. I think it is a fourth complex. There is a pseudo pseudo S also. So this one, this pseudo R in V1 and pseudo S in elite two, yeah, yeah, it goes in favor of yeah, this uh, slow fast uh, SVT. 
So this one is very nice, <laughs> but yeah, it's easy for the classic type, slow fast SBT, because SBT can be of two types. Mostly it is slow, uh, slow fast, then comes the fast slow, and sometimes it is slow slow also, but its occurrence is less than 1%, I think. Thank you, Ravinda. Akhi, if you have, uh, because we're running short of time, we'll just quickly take us to another area. Can we discuss another ECG with left bundle runs block and complete hard block? LBV with complete hard block. That is very interesting ECG, I, I think. Yes, sir. Dr. Uh, Khaled. Yeah. This is the left one runs block with complete hard block. It is not complete hard block. This is, this is PR interval is fixed. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. Second degree, movie type to second degree hard block. Yes. So, movie type to second degree. ECG, what happens there when this patient has got left one nerve blood? It may be old event or it may be new event. When the patient present with chest pain and is it the past documentation? Or it may be the pre-existent left one nerve block and develop the second degree heart block. So in such situation, the treatment option depends on the how the patient is presenting. On that basis, we have to take the decision. And for the learners, this is, is very important if the patient presents with the uh, new onset chest pain and new onset left one nerve block, then definitely we have got a plan for the primary PCI. So what will be approached in this patient is very important for the learners. One is we have to stabilize the rate. Number two, which vessel will recanalize for the PCI. That is also important. Sometimes we, what will be our strategy? If you discuss with the, that, that it may give good information for the learners. Sir, you have already said that you stabilize the patient with a pacemaker, a temporary pacemaker, and do an angiogram and see what is the situation. When you come to a critical blockage, then proceed accordingly. If it doesn't, then just, you know, if it says normal, it's also possible that pre-existing LBBB, everything else was there, patient, because chest pain could be a kind of, you know, what is called, um, uh, is it a, uh, just a, send a finding which may not have much relevant. Many people may cause, cause chest pain. Sometimes patient is having syncopal attack. His son is saying they had chest pain and they had syncope. So better to better do an angiogram. If the angiogram shows critical blockage, you have to, to manage the blockages. If it doesn't, then of course later on put a permanent test. Important. This is important. Also, if the patient has got the ischemic or dilated cardiomyopathy with this morphology, then we have to go for the selection of definite type of uh, resynchronization therapy along with pacemaker. That is also important for the learners. Right. This is important. This is, I think, your collection is a really attractive, really attractive collection. I think we should move now if, we, if the chair, chairman permits. Uh, Professor Avin Chakraborty, uh, as it's a body arrhythmia. I would uh, request uh, Professor Mohsin if he with us or Dr. Professor Dr. Mukaddes Sadi, please if any comment because uh, as a electrophysical physician, please you may put some comment. <clears throat> Professor Mohsin or Professor Mukaddes uh, Sadi, are you with us? If not, uh, please go ahead, please. Right. Now we should discuss a certain non ischemic and non arrhythmic heart disease. A 40 year old gentleman, uh, two day history of intermittent chest pain, history of smoking, hyperlipidemia, and peptic ulcer disease. On, on, on complaining of temperature is 37.5, blood pressure normal, pulse is 90, heart sounds are distant, scratchy murmur over the precordium. I think you got the diagnosis from the history itself. Echocardiogram essentially normal, chest x normal. This is the ECG. What you can see, there is ST elevation, but there is a concavity, lead one, lead two, and uh, the other lead, uh, you know, V two, V three, lead V one is the downward segment, AV one down, AVL is up, and at the same time, there are certain changes. Like if you, if you focus very closely, the PR segment. This is P and this is R. This PR segment is actually downward. So there is PR segment is downward is important. So if you find this the PR segment downward in anterior picardia, anterior lead, two, one, two, and inferior lead, and also the 
PRF segment is upward in AVR, this suggests acute pericarditis. So this is the finding where you can find rate is 84, rhythm is sinus, PR interval is normal, PR segment is elevated in AVR, depressed in 1, 2, V5, V6. And this is a classical ECG finding of acute pericarditis. So this is an example how why the PR segment is downward in 1, 2 and upward in AVR, V6 <coughs> again is up. And if you find ST elevation concave, you are finding 1, 2, AVL, V2, V6. And there are no reciprocal change. These are the such findings of acute pericarditis. So it is caused by inflammation of the pericardium. I'm not going to the theoretical aspect of it, but what is important that such kind of finding has to be noted in acute pericarditis. There is another thing which is important. Sometimes we talk about the angle. For example, the P, uh, the PR interval, if you go down, then you can see it clearly here. For example, this one shows that it is going like going down, going down. The angulation, PR segment is going down. That is a suggestion that this is always due to pericarditis. It is a pericardial disease, not the biocardial disease. Next one. This is very interesting. You see here, 66 year old gentleman complaining of breathlessness, diabetes, alcohol. And ECG shows that this is very interesting. This is a 12 lead ECG. What is important that this patient, the precordial lead is quite big. Got a very high voltage precordial, very high. V1, V2, V3, very high. But limb lead is very small. So limb lead is small, precordial lead is big. It is confirmatory. And in addition to that, there is left atrial enlargement. It indicates that this patient has got dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a dilated heart. So if in a dilated cardiomyopathy, you get the limb leads are short, recorded it is long. That is a diagnostic of dilated cardiomyopathy. He is diabetic, he is alcoholic. So chances of dilated cardiomyopathy is there. So you should go for an echocardiogram. Echo showed this is a dilated LV. This is a dilated cardiomyopathy. And another patient of same, like you can see, very minuscule recorded lead but tall uh, R wave in, in uh, sorry, minuscule limb lead and tall R wave in precordial lead shows dilated cardiomyopathy. Sometimes what may happen is like this patient has previous CABG with shortness of breath. This is an interesting observation. This patient is diabetic, had previous bypass surgery. What is interesting, the precordial leads, they show complete right bundle branch block, right? Precordial leads show light right bundle branch block. If you look at the limb lead, Limb leads show left bundle branch block. If you look at lead one and AVL. So limb leads are showing left bundle branch block. Precordial lead shows right bundle branch block. This is known as masquerading bundle branch block. This is an extreme end of dilated cardiomyopathy where the, it affected the conduction system in such a manner that patient has gone to significant LV dysfunction. This is not only a diagnostic of dilated cardiomyopathy, it is also uh, an ominous sign if a dilated cardiomyopathy patient, left ventricular dysfunction patient goes into goes into a kind of a LV dysfunction, then the patient may, the natural history of the patient is little odd. This patient may not survive for a longer period of time. This is popularly known as masquerading bundle branch block. So precordial lead RBBB, limb lead LBBB. This is another ECG which shows patient has recurrent attacks of syncope, and patient has also got shortness of breath. This is called epsilon wave, a classical finding of, of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or ARVC, epsilon wave. There are many reasons of mechanism of epsilon wave. It's a hallmark of ARVC. It's a marker of delayed activation of right ventricular T1 and outflow tract and is considered a major diagnostic criteria for ARVC. It is always found between the end of the QRS complex to the onset of QRS in the right precordial limb. There are many reasons for that. I'm not going to get into detail, but this is an example of ARVC. Cardiac MRI is an important, cardiac MRI is probably the change, is, is probably the important investigation today to confirm the diagnosis. Another patient, a 28-year-old gentleman with fever for three days, complaining of lightheadedness, CPR at an institute emergency, ECG showed fine ventricular fibrillation. So this is a classical example of Brugada syndrome. You can see this is a typical Brugada syndrome ECG. And in Brugada, you can find such kind of pseudo-RBBB sort of thing. 
we also remember that in addition to Brugada, we should also remember Rishi ECG funding that by Brugada Brothers, a classical RSR in V1, V2, incomplete right management block. V1, V2 is elevation, but down sloping. This is, this is an example how to differentiate from RBBB. This is Brugada syndrome. I'm, we, I'm sure you all know about it. But what is important, you also should remember, what is pseudo Brugada syndrome? In pseudo Brugada syndrome, the same changes may be found, but it doesn't it extend beyond V3, V4 to V6. If you go beyond V4, V5, V6, that do not happen. That doesn't happen in, in Brugada syndrome. If that happens, that's most likely ischemic heart disease. That's called pseudo Brugada syndrome. There are many causes of pseudo Brugada syndrome. One of them is ischemic heart disease, like in this case. And another patient, severe uh, upper abdominal pain with muscle weakness, a lady, nausea, vomiting, ST segment elevation. This is not ischemic heart disease. If you find ST segment elevation in precordial lead, what is important that we do not look at the QT interval. QT is very short. So ST elevation with short QT interval with history of upper abdominal pain, weakness of nausea, weakness of muscle weakness, nausea, vomiting, nose, uh, talks about hypercalcemia. So hypercalcemia tells you the pseudo infarct ECG, pseudo ST elevation, which may look like infarction, but that is not infarction because the QT interval is short. In ischemic heart disease, QT interval is either normal or prolonged. That is a point one has to remember. So this is hypercalcemia. Similar in another case, this is hyperkalemia. There is a nice correlation with the potassium so beyond 5.5 to 6.5, the tall peak P wave, beyond 6.5 is widening of this and peak wave, and after 8, it is sine wave. That question was a sine wave. Similarly, hypokalemia, this is an ECG of hypokalemia. I think you should stop it there. Uh, anything? I'll just show one more ECG and probably by that time we can finish it up. Any comments from the from the experts? Any comments from experts or any questions from our participants? Jobinda, can I see the again, first, again? Uh, again. <laughs> want to make one comment in uh, pericarditis. Yeah, pericarditis. Yeah, pericarditis is easy. Go ahead. Yes. No, 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 this one. Yes. I want to make ah, one, one comment, only this one comment to me. Yeah. Because there it's is a... elevation in most of the leads showing that is elevation in lead three and lead two. Sometimes the inferior myocardial infarction and pericarditis differentiation may be difficult. Even by but... all means, the diagnosis may not be 100% clear. But one thing we can consider, the vector of the pericardium goes towards lead two. So in case of pericarditis, usually there is a elevation maximum in lead two, but in case of inferior myocardial infarction, the maximum ST elevation occurs in lead three. But there is exception with the involvement of the coronary arteries, but commonly <coughs> we can use this type criteria as well, and rest of the criteria is already Professor Robin Chakraborty discussed. This is my one comment. And another ECG in, I think, uh, Professor Borin Chakraborty, you can discuss with this ECG. Fact, then I will also want to discuss on P, my precordial long leads and limb, short limb leads. That is the dilated cardiomyopathy with enlarged left atrium. I want to make one comment on that ECG. After your discussion, but, please. Uh, just looking at this ECG, sometimes it may mimic ERP, this uh, early repolarization pattern like that. There is J point elevation and upward concavity, tall peak T, sometimes, sometimes, but it is a pericarditis. And Dr. Robin Chakraborty already discussed that this patient has got definitely diffuse concavity, upward concavity, HT elevation, and it does not tell you the acute myocardial infarction. And there's definite PR interval, say the PR segment depression in the lead two and, and some other leads also. And another important thing is that this uh, uh, ECG has got the PR segment elevation in AVR and ST septal depression in, in AVR. So this one is very classical of the pericarditis. But few, one thing goes against pericarditis that if you look at the heart rate, usually pericarditis is associated with tachycardia, but this patient don't have any tachycardia. But 
I want to mention, in fact, in this ECG, there is one important sign. This is called for the diagnosis of pericarditis, which is present in 80% cases of acute pericarditis, but in the acute, um, I mean, acute setting, because acute pericarditis has got five stages of ECG changes. But that is called spodiac sign. Uh, by Dr. Robin Chakrabarty, am I correct? This podiac sign. And the yeah, idea, have you ever met Dr. Spodiac? Dr. Spodiac is a very good friend of mine. He yeah, was in hospital. Fine, fine. He I has to go to his hospital. Oh, he has Every just got podiac. one sign. And this, this um, ECG pattern has got that one. Spodiac has described that one. The, his uh, identification is the TP segment, where the T, the downslope of the T and the POA merges in a downsloping. And this is called, this is not, if, if you look at the, how the, the downward slope of the H, uh, the TOF and look at the POF, how it merges. It merges with downward slope as in making an arc. And this arc is called spodiac sign and it is present in 80% cases of pericarditis. And this is a sign of acute pericarditis, honor to that uh, personality. So that is very, very wonderful much person. I met him a number of times. I used to go yeah, to yeah. the hospital. So, next to Charles was <laughs> so this sign has been described in pericarditis. So uh, Dr. Akon Bai can start that one. That one I can yeah, this is, I have a question for Dr. And short limb leads. That is the finding of the dilated cardiomyopathy with enlarged lift atrium. Yeah, that one, that one, that one. That one. That one. That one. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh. Yeah, dilated cardiomyopathy. This is a very classic ECG, but uh, there is also widening of the POF as well, and there is biphasic and prominent downward sloping in V1. And this finding is also important to diagnose the lip, lip atrial lip. enlargement. But long and short QRS in limb and precordial lead is important because the left ventricular hypertrophy can produce the left atrial enlargement as well as the diagnostic criteria for the left ventricular hypertrophy. So left ventricular hypertrophy and dilated cardiomyopathy differentiation is uh, this is important. So, so I in this ECG, well um, I want to add one thing. The professor Chak um, uh, Robin Chakravarti originally told that this special this classical one, but classical dilated cardiomyopathy has been described by Goldberger. The Goldberger, the PCM ECG diagnosis is called the Goldberger style. The Goldberger style includes. Did you finish your comment, sir, please? I just started it. I, I want to say only two <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, please continue. Because carry on, carry on, please. In fact, there is no specific ECG signs of DCM, but we guess from it from the Goldberger style. Goldberger classically described three triads for diagnosis of DCM, and this triad includes the poor ROA progression from V1 to V4. This patient has got another one. Second one is the voltage criteria of LVH, but this one is not present. Paran sir, you are, you are uh, muted uh, probably. Paran sir, can you unmute yourself? Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. So this, this Goldberger triad out of the three criteria, two criteria is present. The QRS complexes are less than seven millimeter in the first limb, uh, the, all the limb list. There is poor ROA progression to V1 to V4, but the only LBH criteria is not present here. But this patient has got the... The uh, secondary criteria for DCM has got the left atrial enlargement. And this one, usually the left atrial enlargement, we know that there's a notched P wave in uh, lead one, lead two, and everywhere there's a notching. And another one, that the downward deflection, that is left atrial component in the V1 is much lower than that of the right atrial component. And if we measure this on the Morris index, Definitely, the modest index for the identification of the left atrial enlargement must be more than 0 0.04 seconds. So, this one is a classical ECG of the DCM dilated cardiomyopathy. Thank you. Thank you, Bhan sir. Now, uh, Professor Khalikujjaman uh, wants to ask some well, question to Professor I have Robin. Question uh, from the ECG of the acute pericarditis because it may mimic the features of the acute inferior myocardial infarction, where the concomitant and atrial infarction may be likely. How will you differentiate the atrial infarction from 
pericarditis ECG because they may produce similar ECG findings. I they think Warren, you can, Warren, you can answer that question. I think PDF, there's podiac sign we'll talk about it. Podiac sign you can talk about and PRT. Another thing is that the left atrial enlarge, uh, sorry, left atrial, inf uh, sorry, atrial infarction, That's usually left atrial infarction usually infarct the right, right atria. And there is the index, Lewis index for diagnosis of the uh, atrial infarction. The PR segment can go both down and can go up. PR segment may be elevated, may be depressed in, uh, yeah, uh, in uh, atrial infarction. But in pericarditis, always PR segment is depressed, not elevated. This is one of the important things. Another thing is that when the patient has got atrial infarction, it usually associated with some sort of arrhythmia. Either it is APC or it is atrial fibrillation and uh, we, so this way we can differentiate whether the patient has got pericarditis or the uh, atrial infarction. Another important is that atrial infarction is always associated with specific territory involvement. Either it is anterior, either it is inferior or posterior. But in pericarditis, the ST elevation will be diffuse and everywhere. So All by using the Lewis criteria, we can differentiate the atrial infarction from the, the uh, pericarditis. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Excellent. I think, can I move uh, now? Robin, sir, please. Epsilon wave, because the epsilon wave is very important. Uh, who, the people who are going to be a cardiologist should know about the epsilon wave, though, though it is very uncommon. Again, I, I, I must Thank Professor Rubin Chakraborty to showing this kind of ECG because arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, that is a very uncommon and difficult diagnosis. So just at looking at the ECG, if we get the epsilon wave, that helps us to make the diagnosis. And also it focus on the pathophysiologic changes that, that is the fibro fatty deposition in the right ventricular that produces that kind of ECG, morphologic changes. So it is very important ECG. And for the learners, this kind of ECG should be seen repeatedly because in our practice, very rarely we get this type of ECG. I ask many One of the thing I want to add for the beginners, this epsilon wave, though it is very classical for the ARBC, but it is always confused with the Osborne wave of the hypothermia. Because they are, their position is the same. So sometimes it is confused whether it is hypothermia. So those who are my fellows and our students, they must know that epsilon wave and Osborne wave or hypothermia almost looks alike. But so clinical but differentiation is very important. Okay. Is it sometimes that, is, that is very important. Robin, sir. And, uh, and uh, respected, uh, uh, Robin, sir, and respected chairpersons. Yes, uh, there is a question in the chat box from uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, uh, in the pericarditis ECG, I also see that there are some J waves. So, is this also benign early reproduction syndrome? I no, I think Dr. Dr. Warren Chakravarti very clearly explained to be explained very clearly. J point has been very widely discussed. So I think it is will just a repetition of the same. Probably the person who put the question he did not listen to the to the comments made by Dr. Dr. Boris Chakravarti. Okay, sir, then uh, if there is no discussion about the previous issues, then uh, can you please go to the next bend, bend of the... We'll move forward. Maybe I just show maybe two more issues and then we can we can close the session. Meanwhile, this particular that ARVC, we don't we call it atmogenic atmogenic cardiomyopathy these days. Uh, this is my own patient. Patient has come from Indian oil and uh, very interesting. He actually initially came to me with the atrial flutter, which I, which I ablated. And it even very well for a long period of time. After that, he came back to me with a with a further sort of, you know, uh, extension of the disease, progression of the disease. He had VT. Then I put ICD. Then after ICD, which is a number of shocks, then I had to change the ICD. Then uh, he actually, after the second time, he got infection of the pocket. So we had to change it. And then uh, we had a little tough time. Then you had to put subcutaneous ICD. So uh, that is what, what is the story like. He's still living, but in a, he's, not, he's not doing well. He's, I have done it many years ago. I think it is nearly, I would say 2005 or six I have done. So 12 to 13 years, the patient survived. Still surviving, but with a long period of time. He has retired from the job and he's, he's, this is a 
very they very sort of very close to me this particular patient we'll move to the last two ecg i'm sure you will be enjoying it pseudo brugada i think if we feel i can take another session about interesting ecg all depends upon this this is the patient uh, where you can see the very white qrs complex at at a, at a first glance it looks like a sort of sine wave of hyperkalemia that is the reason i wrote that the the potassium is normal patient is on on an anti arrhythmic anti arrhythmic drug so remember the class 1 anti arrhythmic drug like propofenon may actually cause such kind of uh, sorry ecg abnormality which can mimic sign of hyperkalemia or extensive this kind of ecg or hyperkalemia like this as i told you earlier that uh, this will be potassium will be something like 7.5 to 8 so uh, it's almost similar looking ecg you may think the mechanism here is like this what happens that because of sodium channel blockage there could be bradycardia there could be qrs qrs duration more than 100 millisecond patient may have seizure there could be ventricular dysrhythmia there could be right uh, axis deviation and the avr looks like this this is a fragmented down sloping of the r segment is very important and r by ratio s ratio is more than 0.7 so this is one thing one has to remember and in fact if you keep your patient on anti arrhythmic drug like i'm not i'm not sure whether you get propafenone flecarite in in bangladesh we have it yeah, yes sir we we use infrequently but so remember that while the patient on these drugs please follow them up with ecg every time do an ecg and also ask them whether they get any seizure whether they get any bradycardia these are the important things and in the ecg look at these signs these are important because sometimes people may get carried away with electrolyte abnormality this is just for information and finally i'm going to show a very interesting ecg that is the last ecg of the day what is this ecg diagnosis whole mitral infarction sinus tachycardia they can see malfunction pacemaker a normal ddd paced ecg or overdrive pacing with atrial tachycardia you can see it is a qrs complex is narrow but there are spike pacemaker spikes right isn't it there are pacemaker spikes both at the atrial point as well as the ventriculars preceding ventricular qrs there is a qrs complex there is a spike before qrs complex but in a pacemaker ecg actually the qrs complex is white because when you pace the ventricular you are pacing the right ventricular apex so which actually creates a an an artificial left bundle branch block so the pace complex will show you something like white qrs and lbbb morphology in this ecg there are pace complex preceding qrs but qrs complex is narrow and it is not a left bundle morphology configuration if you look at b1 b2 or even later on b5 this is very narrow so what could be the reason answer to this is this is not a mi this is not a malfunction of pacemaker this is a normal ddd pacemaker the only thing as you all know i am not sure whether you doing whether you are doing it in bangladesh or not in india we are actually doing lot of left bundle area pacing or his bundle pacing we have, i have done for a good number of his bundle but all of us are doing his bundle pacing now and also of late i started doing left bundle pacing and we nowadays we call it left bundle area pacing because to be very precise that it is it is in his bundle is difficult you need to have an ep lab you have to be very good in ep it takes long time and i have to say that nowadays even the companies industries leads are not that good you have to do lot you have to really struggle to put it in his bundle so and only one company is marketing at the moment the second company has just coming in so we call calling it left bundle area pacing it is one of those cases where it was a left bundle area pacing that is the reason you have we have some suggestion that there could be left bundle but most of the time it is narrow qrs and is very physiological it is extremely important we are actually in fact today we had a patient we are th- we are thinking of doing crt with his bundle pacing and right atrial pacing which will behave like a narrow qrs so with that i finish my my presentation if you have any question or anything uh, you may you may please continue any comment i i look thank you ravin sir uh, uh, before concluding uh, there is a question from lieutenant colonel nizamul hosen do Uh, it's not related to ecg but he are, he is asking that whether arbc can happen in left ventricle then oh, it yes. is uh, it oh, is yes. called also arbc oh, yes. not absolutely. arbc absolutely this is very good oh, question sir? of course this is a very good question please remember 
arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is not the exclusive property of right ventricle it actually goes beyond right ventricle it has been shown that intraventricular septum is involved now with cardiac mri we are actually recognizing that even the significant part of left ventricle particularly the inferior wall or posterior wall of left ventricle is also affected and this is a progressive disease so eventually the, both the ventricles can be affected it is a it is a ventricular disease doesn't really matter whether right or left but predominantly right ventricle to start with as of now but progressively it gets involved left ventricle in fact that so called right ventricle involved involvement if you do a cardiac mri you will actually will find that left ventricle is also probably there are some patchy areas of early involvement yes absolutely thank you thank you professor robin chakravarti for your excellent delivers uh, uh, who is uh, i think dr kadir has got a quick, quick comment uh, before before uh, dr dipal i have some yeah, yeah. question please actually uh, i'm asking i'm asking the question yes i'm just formally uh, uh, congratulating professor robin chakravarti for his excellent and interactive uh, presentations जमान <laughs> टू <laughs> 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 इंग्लिश चक्रवर्ती Uh, inter interesting ecg my question that now it is we are giving special and valvular cages we are using digoxin but in low doses but injectable not you just mostly but uh, once upon a time we could get uh, digoxin toxicity or digoxin effect but now it is uh, rarely I, i never seen but uh, have you any experience or our panelists have you any experience now it is and another question in our cisu monitoring uh especially our the small monitor uh, which list represent that this is lead 2 or v1 we could not understand even after using the uh in the temporary pacemaker we could not see the spike uh, event sure sometimes so uh, and, and have you any comment in this regard i just quickly take you the, the, the which lead should be to be taken up for the monitor the monitor normally monitors one lead it at times in some monitor you can make you can monitor two leads ideally there is no fixed formula it all depends upon the clinical setting if you have a patient who has been on a temporary pacemaker for that patient you should monitor monitor either v1 because that is there you can get a nice signal if a patient has got ischemic heart disease like infarction other kind of thing you should monitor that lead which that is the best one to pick up the area of infarction for example in inferior infarction you could pick up lead 2 in an anterior infarction you pick up precordial because this is the usual thing and otherwise for rhythmic disorder lead 2 is quite acceptable even in general this is the kind of standard for but each has to be decided depending upon the clinical setup clinical situation there is no formula in the monitor you got you have three four options so choose the option depending upon the clinical diagnosis of the patient that is one one point and and the other thing i think what else you asked about uh, digoxin and digital uh, toxicity in fact i had i had three ecgs on digoxin which i skipped because of time maybe uh, sometimes in, in, in future if i get an opportunity digoxin is still an area which has to be discussed various points are there in fact i had a nice uh, ecg session 
uh, in United States at uh, the Michigan University, and they don't use digoxin much. So they, they, the professor Eric was very happy when I brought this issue. I can present, I can present that uh, presentation also uh, whenever you are. Uh, my question is actually frequency. Once upon a time, this was very frequent, and uh, the Salvador Dali sagging appearance. Once upon a time, this was very very uh, popular term, and uh, that uh, downstroke against depression uh, with uh, characteristic salvador dali sagging but now my question is uh, in valvular cases we use very low doses digoxin and we know that the low dose only not important the renal clearance also important here so my question is uh, how frequent frequency of the ecg features of digoxin toxicity or uh, ecg features of digoxin digoxin toxicity itself is a huge chapter a lot of features are there which I have some issues which I did not discuss. I, have, so okay. I, I kept in my bypass that, but quickly I'll tell you. First, you remember that the, the, that sign that you are talking about, the popularly known, known as hockey stick sign, that, that is not a sign of digoxin toxicity. That is the sign of digitalis effect, right? Yes. Dig yes. Digoxin toxicity is in addition to other signs like atrial ectopic, AV block, bradycardia, Ventricular ectopic, atrial uh, arrhythmias, atrial, even atrial fibrillation is also a part of a lot of when arrhythmias are also, and even AV block, uh, there's a lot of uh, toxicities are there. But what important is that, that there's a fundamental difference between digitalist effect and digitalist toxicity is if you find that hockey stick sign is only found in that lead which has got the tallest R. Tallest star. The ECG, the lead showing tallest star shows optistic sign is an indicator of digitalist effect. If you find the same sign is being seen in all the leads, doesn't matter whether R is tall or short, that is the earliest sign of digitalist toxicity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dipal, you may have Professor Zaman Hoti uh, tried to know probably. They nowadays we are not getting the patient with digitalist toxicity e or exactly sir. Ex exactly sir. The reason for is that because the two er two important sites of use of digoxin is the valvular heart disease, another is the heart failure. But if we look at the algorithm for the management of the heart failure, digitalis is not in the any algorithm. It is exactly, mentioned sir. at the bottom of the list. So the use of digoxin is replaced by the beta blockers, by the arrival of different beta blockers having better effect and effect on mortality and morbidity. So the beta blocker replaced the digoxin. As the digoxin use has reduced drastically, that's why the, we do not see the effect, digitalis effect or digitalis toxicity. Yes, sir. But only part early part of our, of our postgraduate career at the beginning of the 90s, we used to get the patient with this effect and toxicities because digoxin was the only medicine that is used in heart failure and valvular heart disease in almost every patient. Even in the absence of arrhythmia, we used to use digoxin in mitral stenosis, digoxin in heart failure patient. That has been changed over the years. Thank you, Zaman. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Abdul Kader um, uh, sir. Uh, actually, in the outset, uh, I requested Professor Robin Chakravarti that uh, today my role will be very less because it's an uh, interactive session uh, and uh, Professor Robin has acted very well and all of our uh, panelists uh, interacted very well. But, uh, but Dr. Gonoputi Aditya, are you there? Uh, yes, you thank come, you, sir. Can you give some comment, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you, Professor uh, Ravin Chakraborty, sir. And uh, my dearest sir, Professor Shajan Krishna Bharji, sir, I am seeing. Really, it was, it was an excellent and masterpiece uh, presentation by Professor Ravin Chakraborty. And I enjoyed a lot. And two Chakraborty and also Professor <laughs> Boron Chakraborty and who, who cleared many things clearly. Oh, his book again. <laughs> no, yes, and we were with a with a big book. I I also uh, I, I am also a copy. 
uh, from here. Uh, today I have, uh, I again congratulate all the speakers and, and especially Professor Robin Chakraborty sir. And I have learned a lot by this, by this session. And thanks everybody. And I am seeing uh, Professor Khalegu Jumas Bhai and, uh, and uh, best wishes everybody. And thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonapati Aditya. Please enjoy your and, PRL. And one, thing, and one thing, no. Yeah, regarding PRL, PRL <laughs> in, next, in next year, I have not. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have got a wrong message, sorry. Probably you. I have finished my undergraduate lecture, not, oh, yeah. not a proposed graduate. I'll be in PAPRL in 2022. Okay, okay. Okay. So I got the wrong message. Sorry for that. Um, uh, then uh, uh, among our scheduled chairpersons, Professor Chaudhary Mishkat Ahmed, uh, Professor Robert Amin, and Professor Mohsin Hussain, uh, all are absent. Uh, be due to business in other uh, stations. So I will request uh, our uh, incidental chairpersons, those senior persons who. Uh, joined us, uh, we made them as uh, panelists or chairperson. So, can you uh, please contribute? Uh, among them, Professor Mukaddas Hussain Sadi. Uh, can you pass some comment, please? Is uh, Dr. Mukaddas Hussain Sadi there? Uh, then uh, uh, Professor Kubir Jaman from National Art Foundation. No. Then Professor Amal Kumar Choudhury. He is not also there. Uh, uh, Professor Dipal, uh, Professor Dr. Orun Maski with us from Nepal from uh, beginning. Please uh, give a comment, please, uh, Professor Orun Maski from Nepal. He is with us and he's always with our program. Please, I would request Professor uh, Dr. Orun Maski, would you please comment something? I, I know, and from Nepal, a lot of students uh, comment, a lot of questions. So I would request you, please. Professor Orun is not available in the panelists. Uh, uh, I know he's with us. I, I request Professor Orun Maski. No, to, we have to do. Uh, we have to make him a okay. panel first. Uh, okay, first. Can, uh, can you do that, Kutub, Mr. Kutu? Make him call. Sir, uh, uh, he is not available in attendee panel. No, no, no. He told me just now. I call just what telephone we discuss. Uh, I, I need his uh, device name, sir. Okay, I'm. I'm. I'm I can. But he's with us. I mean, so he told the me. He, Khan. Okay. Okay. Sadhiravan Khan, can you please? Yeah, uh, what can I say? Because uh, this is really a very, very uh, interactive presentation from uh, Dr. Ravin Chaudhary, uh, Ravin Chakraborty, and also. And uh, some of it actually, while doing intervention nowadays, even for the fellows, I'm telling that uh, remembering the ECGs and also all the signs and uh, it's very much important because it gives you a pleasure. And it gives you a flavor of being a very good cardiologist. But the one thing that while while seeing the ischemic heart disease ECGs, nowadays I will tell my fellows and uh, obviously to understand which is very, very much emergency and not to wait for the invasive procedures to go on because this is sometimes happening and that while seeing the, this sort of ECGs... It all must be available. Understanding that much, uh, this uh, this uh, the patient becomes very much late for invasive procedures. So this is also very much important. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Professor uh, Rahman, Sadhir Rahman Khan, uh, for your uh, uh, Dr. Dipal, Dr. Arun Maski is with us now as a panelist. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Arun Maski, please, Professor Arun Maski, uh, can, can you uh, pass some comment? Well, thank you. I mean, this was a very good and basic learning for me also. It was Professor Ravin Chakrabarti is a good teacher. 
not only interventionists, good teachers. Thank you for giving such a nice uh, lecture. It was a wonderful lecture, and I hope they always find interesting for us to join. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jaman Bhai, and thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Uh, Rao and other panelists. We all go together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Once the lockdown opens. <laughs> hey, Arun, how are you? <laughs> oh, very much. Everybody loves your book. <laughs> are you, Arun? Very much. His his book is so good. There are twenty or twenty-five residents. They are asking his book. Arun is telling a reading book from the simple to provide book. Trans Himalayan translation. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Sorry. Kutub, uh, can you please uh, make Dr. Kalsar Siddiqui from Calcutta? Uh, he is our uh, ex alumni of uh, BSM Cardiology Department. Yes, and already a, done. Uh, he is a renowned cardiologist, KK Haider Siddiqui, who was the sheriff of Calcutta uh, Municipal Corporation, uh, who has uh, recently passed away from us. Was very popular among uh, our patients uh, in my area. Basically, uh, I am from Khulna, uh, so I am uh, very much uh, uh, what I say. I'm very much uh, grateful to him because Dr. of Kassar our patient service. So, uh, Doctor Kasar Siddiqui, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All. Can you hear can me? You, uh, uh, thank you very much for attending to our session. No, and uh, can you thank please you uh, yeah. pass your comment, please, Dr. Kamal yes, uh, Sabin? Yeah, I just want to say that it's always good to uh, attend your program. First of all, and I'm I've also worked with Dr. Robin Chakraborty, sir. We have worked together. Sir, I'm Dr. Khaver Siddiqui, sir. Yes, yes, I, I, I do. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we all work together. I, and and I remember whenever I used to do uh, some plastic with sir, I used to come back home and I used to tell my dad that I've been doing plastic with Dr. Robin Chakravati. He said he is one of the finest hand in India. And it's really, I, I, I know when I used to attend a CSI conference, whenever Dr. Robin Chakravati used to speak, the room used to be packed. And I've, I mean, how is your camera? We can't see you. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not looking good. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, 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 I have yeah. seen you two days ago. Uh, <laughs> no, you're looking very good. Carry on, carry on, please, with your camera. So carry on, carry it's, on. It, it's all, I know whenever I used to get stuck into any complicated plastics, then immediately uh, one name always used to come to my mind, and that is Dr. Robin Chakraborty. He has helped me and bailed me out in many of the cases, and he is really a very good teacher. And in fact, I've be, I've joined today, obviously for BSAMU, but mainly my target was to learn. Still at this age, from Dr. Robin Chakravarti, we met last time in Delhi. Remember, sir, we were supposed no, to yeah. open. A, no, we, we met recently few days ago, right in Kolkata. Yeah, yeah. We were supposed to make a rehabilitation unit also. Yes. So it will be my pleasure to always work thank with you. Thank, thank you very much for your night. Thank you, Thank you, Sabin. Thank you, Sabin. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sabin. Sabin, good yes. sir. Is sir, 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 good evening, sir. So it was a, yeah. Sir, yeah, it was a very bad moment for us, but still I am trying to cope up. Hopefully everything will be fine. Okay, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sabin, we all pray for your father's departed soul. It was very popular among our uh, yeah, yeah, area yeah. in Kulna. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I received many calls. I received many calls from all over India, then from outside also, from Poland, Spain, long time. I have been associated. He has been associated for the last 40 years, I think. Actually, uh, as a cardiologist, he is my first known name to me uh, as a cardiologist uh, in my childhood. I have, uh, for uh, uh, a cardiologist, this was taken care of. So I am very much grateful to you for joining uh, us. Professor Bravin uh, Chakravarti, sir, can you... Dr. Uh, Jaman also, Dr. Khaliko Jaman already, already, mentioned, already has comment. Dr. Dipal. Dr. Khaliko Jaman... Um, uh, has commented also oh, in also our commented. session. So okay, okay, if, okay. If we if we can uh, do some comments about all of, overall uh, the performance of our speaker, he can uh, spend some words for us also. No, no, no. I don't want to longer the time because it is already. 
was two hours, near yeah, two hours. I don't want to linger the time. Uh, this is a wonderful session, no doubt, and let us congratulate uh, Dr. Robin Chakraborty. He is at the same time clinical cardiologist and uh, the ED specialist and interventional cardiologist, a very old minded person which I have seen from a distance. Today's session also to tell that he is a very uh, you know, he is very expert in the ECG as well as clinical cardiology. So let us congratulate Dr. Robin Chakraborty. As well as the chairpersons who has participated here and who passed comments here was excellent, particularly uh, our Dr. Uh, Robin Ch uh, Dr. Boren, uh, Boren, sir, Boren. Boren sir, from the lab that, that was a very excellent teaching from, uh, from this part. So we are all benefited in terms of learning many things ECG, which is the basic things in cardiology. So thank you the organizers, particularly the Professor Jaman and the Professor Dipal for their uh, initiation. And I will hope that they will continue this ECG session uh, from time to time. And let us invite Dr. Boren Chakra, Dr. Uh, uh, Robin, Robin. Chakra, Robin and Boren, these two, all the words, <laughs> this is very similar. Robin and Boren, B R N. <laughs> so I am repeatedly confused. So thank you, everybody. For, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Khalibur Jaman, for your kind words. Uh, Robin, sir, we have uh, no words to congratulate you. Uh, do you have any comment for us? Sir? Thank you very much. It's a great effort. Mustafa, I mean, I'm very close Thank to you. In fact, when he called me, I'll tell you, because the previous night I was really awake for a long time. So, when he called me, I was sleeping. So, first I could recognize. Then he said, you could recognize me? Then I, <laughs> I got up there by the time, I think. So, and then later on, of course. So, first I was in deep sleep when he called me. It was quite late. In the morning, it was quite late. But the previous night, I was awake very, very late. I slept at 4 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Great job done by you. Uh, now, uh, Professor Jaman, uh, can you say something before okay. we conclude our session? And uh, uh, we uh, we give a heartful thanks to Austin in Pharma, who is our uh, today's uh, scientific partner. And uh, can you give some uh, Thanks to uh, everybody. Before, uh, Professor Shadar Banerjee will conclude, but uh, I will say something uh, because actually we are doing this type of program every week and uh, next week will be another uh, history in Bangladesh because from India, two case uh, intervention uh, case will be uh, live transmission uh, demonstration will be held and this time 8 p.m. We'll discuss and uh, uh, on the operator. That this is the first time. I don't know. I never never uh, seen that uh, from outside the country, live cases of intervention cardiology and the discussion. And uh, I, 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 I hope everybody will enjoy. And I'm well, I welcome all to enjoy that session the next 2nd July uh, or at 8 p.m. And uh, I must thanks to Dr. Robin Chakraborty. Uh, you have um, uh, remembered that uh, the first uh, live cases of Bangabundu Medical University where the Operator of the movie, uh, he, he came to my university and we shared the cath lab. That was tremendous uh, and emotional uh, experience for me also because that was the first live cases of Bangabundu Medical University, not only in the cardiology, all the, the, all, the, all, the, all the department. Mustafa, the, Mustafa gave me a, you know, critical yeah. left main stem. Yeah, yeah exactly. Critical left main stem. How, how, how are those cases? Are they doing well? Patients are okay. And, and a lot of students was in the other side of our uh, Milan, Dr. Milan Hall and Dr. Mir Jamal was there and a lot of questions. We have shared the answer. Uh, that was tremendous uh, memories for me also with you. So thank you again for today's session. Thank you all the chairpersons, participants, and especially uh, from Bangladesh and India and Nepal also, Dr. Ornamaski and Dr. Boran Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdul Qadir Akhand, a lot of, uh, I, I, I did not mention all the chairperson's name. Now I'd request Professor Shazal Banerjee uh, as a, a, a regular, just like he will conclude the session, Professor uh, Shazal Banerjee. Sir. Thank you, Jaman. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. First of all, I must uh, congratulate and express uh, thanks and gratitude to Professor Ravin Chakraborty 
Uh, it was a nice session, excellent academic session. We have enjoyed the whole session. He is three in one. He is a clinical cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, and electrophysiologist. And we have uh, again uh, seen in this session, and he is an unparalleled academician. Uh, I must congratulate uh, for the excellent presentation. Uh, and again, I must express thanks to all the uh, chairpersons, the panelists, the attendees, the moderator, and uh, Professor Mustafa Jaman. Uh, Professor Mustafa Jaman has arranged a nice session for today uh, evening. Uh, the persons from home and abroad uh, who have attended the session, uh, I must uh, congratulate them and welcome them for future sessions. We are doing a, this type uh, session every Friday at 8, uh, 8 p.m., uh, mainly academic uh, session. And uh, we have enjoyed and we have learned many things from uh, today's session. Again, I must uh, thank and congratulate uh, Professor Robin Chakraborty. Robinda, thank you very much. Banglai Bullam. And all the credit goes to Mustafa. His commitment and sincerity is right. unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, hard work, sincerity, and commitment. And Thank eager you, not only to learn himself as well as to advance the specialty in your own country. That is laudable. Unbelievable. I salute you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Robinda. Thank you sir. have uh, give, given the um, right response to our call. Uh, well, we are grateful to you. তো বাংলায় বলি যে ভালো থাকেন সুস্থ থাকেন নিরাপদে থাকেন দীর্ঘদিন সুস্থভাবে বেঁচে থাকেন আমাদের জন্য প্রার্থনা করবেন সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ সবাই যেন ভালো থাকেন অপশন ইন ফার্মাকে ধন্যবাদ অপশন ফার্মাকে ধন্যবাদ